going to be tough. He's talking to Aaron. Three gut shots? Three gut shots. Was Ross just hoping to get paired against Tom? Arc like Phoenix singing in the ice. Gut shots good with. I, mean, yeah. I don't think it's bad. I, I guess it probably does kill a lot of stuff. Kills Champion of the Parish, kills Mobile Hire. Very good against humans. Yeah, really good against good against Man Spirits. Yep. Um, good against Dark Confidant. Okay. All right. It's a lot of those, but very good in this matchup, obviously. Good against Hardened Scales. Mm hmm. It's an aggressive. That's an aggressive deck building decision by Ross, and it might pay off for him, at least in this matchup, maybe the whole weekend. Here we go. Tom will sacrifice Wooded Foothills down to 19. Is it Glistener Elf? It is. Will it live is the question. And you mentioned Ross has a lot of burn in addition to the Gutshots. He's got Bolts, he's got Fiery Tempers. How many Tempers? Two? Uh, two Fiery Tempers, one Lightning Axe, four Bolts, three Gutshots. All right. Steam Vents untapped. Down go kills Nero. Let's go to Ross. Ink Moth Nexus. Another Glistener Elf. Pass the turn. Over to Marion. Scalding Tarn. Sack that. At least 17, maybe 15 here. It'll be 15 as he gets another Steam Vents. Again, life totals more or less a free roll here for Ross Merriam. Given the matchup. And he's got a lot of pressure to have as much blue mana as possible and as much red mana as possible because his deck's all about chaining together. A bunch of one-cost cards in the same turn. It's a thing in the ice. 10-30, Pass the turn back. Let's go over to Tom Ross. Once again, players in the 10-30 seal. That is a Noble Hierarch, and now here is an Exalted 2-2. Ross Merriam is going to take that 2. We're going to go over to Ross Merriam for his third turn of the game. He'll draw a card. Serum Visions in hand, among other things here for Ross Merriam. We'll see how he wants to start off the turn. I mean, he does have to be concerned at this point that if he puts the shields down, uh, he can die even with a blocker back because of the Nexus. It'll be a Serum Visions to start. He'll draw a card, now he'll scry two. Let's see where he wants to put these cards. It looks like they're going to the bottom pretty quickly. So wasn't happy with those. Looks like he does have a land to play, though. Spire Bluff Canal into Faithless Looting. So he'll draw two and discard two here. Looks like a charter course and a scalding turn are going to go to the graveyard. I, I'm, I'm curious on average how big Crackling Drake is in this, de is in this deck. It's probably like always. Yeah. Always like six power. Lethal. Yeah. I think so it's got to be huge. You've got Thing in the Ice and Arclight Phoenix and Bolts and stuff, so you got ways to close out the, the gap if it's not exactly lethal on the one hit. I mean, if you're playing four copies of a four drop in a deck that's trying to play a bunch of, you know, spells all, you know, it's got to be really worth it in, uh, in this deck. I'm, I'm sure it is. Tom's going to start things off with a Pendlehaven, then fire up an Ink Moth Nexus, and then activate the Pendlehaven. Boy. I think I think you activate the Pendlehaven on Glistener Elf? No, I think it's on the Nexus. You think it's on the Nexus? Okay. So this is seven is my count? They have mutagenic. <laughs> so can does Ross have two? He needs like gut shot plus a spell. Maybe a uh, looks like. All right. So thought scour. So he's got to find. He's got to find a gut yeah. shot now. He got to find a. Ooh, he milled one. Oh ho ho. He needs to find a free spell to transform. If he, <laughs> he does not find one, and Tom is gonna win. So. 
the boss picks his spot very, very well. And he's going to win game number one here over Ross Merriam. In fact, up a game over Grixis Phoenix. Three main deck gut shots? No problem. No problem for T. Ross. Then draw one of them. That's right. Easy does it. As we go to the sideboards here, we're going to start with Ross Merriam, who's got three Anger of the Gods, two Abraid, two Collective Brutality, two Dispel, two Surgical Extraction, and four one ups here in Ceremonious Rejection, Disdainful Stroke, Engineer Explosives, and that Ral Is It Viceroy that we saw Ross play last match. Uh, just more removal and cheap interaction here. The Anger of the Gods, Abraid, Surgical Extractions, uh, the Explosives as well. For Tom Ross, two Dissenters Deliverance, two Dispel, two Shaper Sanctuary, two Nature's Claim. And then he's got seven one ofs and Distortion Strike, Spell Skype. Spell Pierce, Graph Trigger's Cage, Relic Progenitus, Dismember, and Carrion Call. Uh, I probably bring in the Dismember here as some protection against Thing in the Ice. Um, I really like the Spell Pierce and the Dispels. And this seems like a great matchup for uh, Shaper Sanctuary. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Those are the options there for both players. As you see, our scoreboard has been updated as well. Aaron Barrett to the Golgari mid-range mirror, currently up a game over Brendan DeCandio, who I think DeCandio's deck is actually pretty tailored towards the mirror, and he's currently down a game. So we might jump that way as Jody Keith and Tan and Grace continue to play their matchup between Eldrazi Post and Grixis Delver. In the meantime, let's talk about giving the gift of FCG. Look at all these fun things that you can find here. If you go to go.starcitygames.com slash SCG merch, we got hoodies, we got game nights, we got gift packs, we got all sorts of awesome products like Tarmo Dice, Super Hives, Archives, Binders, SCG Creature Collection Sleeves, Ultimate Guard Boulders. Head over to go.starcitygames.com slash SCG merch. Find something for you as we're working ourselves into Black Friday and Christmas even, man. We're getting close to that season. Right? It's almost holiday season. Go quick. get some merch. Drink it in. It's short for merchandise. Man. It's marketing slang. <laughs> nice. Back to the match. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, the boss, T. Ross, he's back here on the SCG Tour, currently up a game in what appears to be a pretty bad match. But we watched him early, earlier today. He lost a really good matchup, so maybe things are evening out for the 35-year-old with his 18 open top baits, six open wins, and he's back playing Magic after a... Ah, pretty short stint at Wizards of the Coast. I think it was a year that he was on the play design team, and if he helped design Guilds of Ravnica, kudos to you, boss man, because that set's awesome. Yeah, very well received. Um, and now Tom left Wizards of the Coast, had the itch to start battling again, and uh, making his debut Pro Tour recently, and now back here. He's a card player, man. Yeah. He's a winner. He's playing Infect again. Played a very, very nice game there. That's for sure. He's always been good at picking his spots with that deck. And I'm curious to see, you know, I know that Tom wrote about mono-white aggro in standard. I'm curious to see if, uh, what he's going to do with that standard format. You know, th these mono-red is very much his speed. Boros aggro decks, very much his speed. Mono-white aggro, obviously, something he enjoys as well. So uh, this standard format could actually be turned on its head a little bit here because he might find the perfect build to attack standard with. Can't wait. Same. I'm, you know, it's good to have good people working over at Wizards of the Coast, obviously. Helps make the product better, but... There's some people that I'd rather have out here than back there. Even if mean the game suffered a little bit, <laughs> Tom's one of them. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. So it's good to have it's good to have him back, that is for sure. Frost Merriam down a game right now. I'm very interested in his deck though. I hope we have the opportunity to do a deck tech with him this weekend. These Phoenix strategies are really starting to make a name for themselves here in modern arc like Phoenix, obviously a very powerful card, and the 29-year-old from Connecticut is trying to employ that. He's got 22 open top eights to Tom's 19, but Tom's got six wins where Ross only has four. Ross with two invitational top eights to Tom's four, and Tom's got those two envy wins where Ross doesn't have one just yet. But I imagine that will be coming sooner rather than later. Member of Team BCW with this Phoenix strategy, a little bit of black splash in the sideboard, but blue-red in the main deck. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be enjoying how these Arclight Phoenix decks evolve because obviously the card is very good and it's not hard to bring back from the graveyard. And there's a lot of room for customization too. Yeah. Um, you know, you can do the cantrip stuff, you can do the looting stuff, you can do the burn stuff, you can kind of blend those different approaches together. So uh, a card that allows for a lot of iteration in deck building too, which is cool. Yeah, that is a... Uh, it's really interesting. Like the, the card when it was previewed didn't really bring a lot of hype along with it, mm -hmm. but now I think a lot of players have gotten their hands on this thing and seen exactly what it can do. It's obviously very, very powerful, not hard to bring back from the graveyard, and uh, I'm interested. I'm interested to see what's going to happen here with this card and just kind of the evolution of it. It's obviously very, very good. 
We're also in the play here for game number two. You see that uh, Tana and Jody are pretty deep into a uh, into a first game here. Fun thing about team tournaments, you see Tom and Jody, longtime friends from the New Orleans area. They're chatting on what to do here. Tannen also from Louisiana, down yep. in Baton Rouge. Louisiana, hidden, hidden little magic scene. Those players are good down there. Tom, Jody, Tannen, and uh, Brian Masoko as well. <laughs> Two-time team open champion Brian Masoko. And then Barrett is from the Mississippi area, not too far from these guys. They got the skills to pay the bills as we begin here. Ross Merriam with his steam vents enters the battlefield tapped. For Tom, he'll sacrifice a windswept teeth. This is a glistener elf. See what Landy wants to get here. Tom will get a basic forest. Manamorphos here for Ross after playing a Spire Bluff Canal, so he'll draw a card. Get some combination of mana. And now there's a Faithless Looting with a mana floating. Tom got to present his deck to Ross. Ross going to shuffle very quickly here. Manamorphos was red, red, so there will be a red mana floating. Thank you to our table spotter for letting us know. And now the looting. Let's see what cards are going to go to the graveyard here. Looks like an Anger of the Gods and a Faithless Looting we place in the graveyard. Now there's a bolt to take care of, or at least attempt to take care of, the Glistener Elf. Does he have two? All right. Arclight Phoenix is going to come back to the graveyard. Doesn't have to attack. Yeah, it's not going to. All right. Interesting exchange there. Yeah, I mean, I guess Ross doesn't really have a choice if it's his one infect threat, but it's pretty rough to spend a lot of resources preserving it if Ross is just going to recur a blocker that you have no interest in trading with. Yeah. That's seeing the Arc Clay Phoenix come back, and you have to imagine that Ross can bring it back again. It's not that hard for him to do. Here comes Glistener Elf. That's a ground swell to take care of that. I guess Tom is banking on I don't think you can return this again. But that's kind of what Ross's deck is built to do. Yeah, I think he's gonna be disappointed if that's the line. Flooded strand here from Merriam. He's gonna search up a basic island. I mean, Tom's had to use three pump spells already. Now, if his hand is pump spell heavy, it, it's not a problem, but makes you wonder just how many he has. Eleven a.m. Standard players, your next round pairings have been posted. Please find your seats so that we can begin. Step one is the Seren Visions here for Miriam, so he'll draw a new next card. Round and now he's going to scry too. And I think he found a metamorphose off of the Serum Vision, and if that's the case, it's it should be trivial for him to recur the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. He'll split the difference on the scry, so one on top and one on bottom there for Ross. That's his first spell played this turn. He's just going to pass the turn back, so he's a little bit more reactive now, it appears. Will Tom crack that fetch land in his upkeep? We see him do that on occasion, and he will. I'm gonna get another basic force. No islands here for the boss just yet. I'm trying to see the blue count here in his deck. Try to find the blue count here. Huh. Breeding pools, of course. He's got two basic forests, three breeding pools. Okay. No island. A lot of fetch lands, as usual. Because he has a couple copies of Become Immense here this weekend. There's a breeding pool, so now he's got some blue mana. He's going to take a little bit more damage. Here comes Glistener Elf. Is he willing to make a move? Well, he's answering these questions for me. <laughs> There's become a mess. He is not messing around. Response. Dispel the become a mess. Spell pierce there. Okay. So that's going to be seven damage. Seven infect damage, pardon me. Let's move back over to Ross.
But Ross sort of suggesting here that he's on empty because there was a, a lot of his cards allowed him to try to go for a kill in that spot. I suppose it still could be vines. Yeah, that was that was the, that was the first thing I thought of. Is the last card could be vines to yeah. protect it against another removal spell. Yeah, so I guess Ross still needs to be mindful of vines. Steam vents untapped. Four mana is Crackling Drake. Okay, well, oh, that's a blocker. And a big one at that. So let's go back over to Tom Ross. It's a blocker, and then it's just lethal on the way back. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> yeah. Ross's deck is very, very. Ross Merriam's deck. I don't want to confuse the Rosses here. Um, Ross Merriam's deck is very interesting to me. It's got a lot of new cards. Yeah, because I, I saw a Crackling Drake in the deck list, and it just seems so slow and. And then it's like, oh no, it's actually lethal every time. <laughs> can't, can't bolt it. Can't bolt it. Um, tough to push. Can't abrupt decay it. I, I feel like it dodges a lot of removal spells. Flying obviously matters. I think another thing that's big about it too is because of four toughness. Now, and of course, Humans does a nice job of making Mantis Rider a four power creature, but, you know, it might be able to brick wall a Mantis Rider or something. Like, yep. It, it strikes me as actually a pretty good card, especially in what's going on in Ross's deck. So, there's a. Blossoming defense to save this Glistener Elf. And I think he's going to bolt him. Yeah, he's just going to bolt him and kill him with the Crackling Drake. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's going to be lethal a yeah. lot. Yeah. A lot of the time. And it was lethal there. So Ross Merriam is going to win game number two here against Tom Ross. Crackling Drake. Uh, Maybe a modern innovation that we weren't expecting. I uh, am uh, would have bet again seeing it this weekend. Yeah, it, it looks really good in this deck. And, and there are four copies. I mean, it's not like a There's one no or two joke. of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the deck is very much constructed with this card in mind. And again, with how, with how Merriam's deck is built, he's going to be able to make that thing six, seven, eight, nine power pretty easily. The turn that it's cast. Right. Because he's putting some Thought Scour, Faithless Looting, Mana Morphos. He's putting a lot of instants into his graveyard. So, very interesting stuff here from Ross. Let you know that Aaron Barich, he wins his match over Brendan DeCandio two games to zero very quickly in the Golgari Midrange Mirror. Now, again, remember that Barich did play Golgari Midrange at the Pro Tour last weekend, worked with Jadine Klumperens and Autumn Burchett. Both players in Jadine and Autumn do have some fantastic content on the premium side of StarCityGames.com. If you haven't seen it this week, I recommend that you do. And then Jody Keith and Tannen Grace, they are playing game number two. That's all Drosley Post versus Grixis Delver. Jody Keith currently up a game. Speaking of content, we'll talk about the StarCityGames.com newsletter. I'm transitioning nicely. Right Smooth. Now. Thank you. Thank you. The Crawl Harpooner of Transitions. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is your source for Match of the Gathering <laughs> news. And Patrick, for you, I want you oh my to God, take a look. Look at that. Take yeah. a look. We updated the graphic for the newsletter. We got beautiful Brian Gottlieb there now. Brian Gottlieb, be uh, excited that your face will be on this advertisement for the next four and a half years. That's correct. Highlights from some of our best articles, like some of the great stuff that Brian Gottlieb does put together. Upcoming SCD Tour dates and locations, possibility storm puzzle solutions, SCG IQs and game nights near you. Best of all, totes free. Go to srcdgamescom slash newsletter for more information. Learn more about Brian Gottlieb and why Living End is back from the dead. It's a good picture, Brian, too. So, you know, that'll be there for a long time. Beard long looks good. time. Glasses look good. All look, Hair looks good. All looks good. Oh, there you go. There you go. We just found out there's a reason it's not a standard article. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great job for the team at home. In Smooth. Rome. Great work. Jenna, if you're watching, great job. So the team on at your right, Keith Ross Barich, currently leading things right now. See if Miriam can tie things up again and watch appears to be a good matchup, and then it'll come down to Grace and Keith. Tan and Grace with Grixis Delver, a deck that he loves and knows so well. I think it's probably a difficult matchup for him against Jody Keith, though the power of Wasteland, if he's able to find multiples, could be quite good. Yeah, I mean you gotta cheat it with a bunch of one mana threats. 
and back it up with Wasteland. If you let Jody get off the ground with his mana, uh, that's going to pretty easily overpower anything that Grace has got going on. Well, these players are just about ready here for game number three of action. But while they're while they're still shuffling and making you wait at home, it means I have to sell you something like subscribing to our YouTube page, perhaps. Maybe you should do that. If you do, you can see Ross there. Miriam, of course. Maybe you see Tom Ross. Hi. Tom Ross, maybe versus versus live, maybe? I mean, mm -hmm. why not? Mm -hmm. Whole lot going on here. First series, Commander versus Flashback. Best of Edge Tour. And much more over at YouTube.com slash Starcity Games. How many subscribers... Is that page up to? We are over 150,000. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Big shout to you at home. Thank you. Appreciate you. Maybe a Tom Ross flashback. Some it would be great. Best, some of his best moments. He's going to start things off with a Verdant Catacombs. For Ross Merriam, it's an island as Serum Visions. He'll draw one, scry two. Ross Merriam, of course, has already done his flashback. A lot of fun there. If you haven't seen it, recommend that you do. It's on the premium side of Star City right now. It'll be on that YouTube page soon. Talking about In-N-Out Burger, his classic match against you in Los Angeles, what was like six years ago now somehow? It's crazy. Yeah, it was a long time That's ago. It's crazy. And, of course, his love for the Utah Jazz. Who lost yesterday, by the way? Slow start for the offense. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Joe Ingles' greatness is not in question. But they're, they're off to a slow start. Here's a blighted agent. You can tell you're a popular basketball player when you turn the ball over 20% of your pick and rolls and the fans still love you. That's true. That's, That's true. true. That shows that you are over. That's a lot of turnovers. <laughs> <laughs> Again, 1 p.m. Modern Challenge. You can find the we love Jinkle and Joe. Now, keep in mind that other land that, that uh, Tom Ross played was an Ink Moth Nexus. So there are two infect threats on the battlefield that Ross Merriam has to be concerned with right now. Uh, I think important for Ross is he have a red source here, which he does. Spire Buff Canal. Thing in the ice is here. Well, now keep in mind Ross Merriam is playing three copies of Gutshot. One in the hand, too. So he can, uh, Gutshot is among the best cards you can have against Infect because it allows you to tap out and go about your business. One of the ways that you get into trouble against Infect is if you have removal that you're leaving up, you're just playing really inefficient magic because you got to sit back with leaving your mana or two mana up. Gutshot lets you tap out every single turn doing whatever you want to do and still having some cover. Tom's got that darn Pendlehaven again, so he's going to Pendlehaven the, the Blighted Agent to make it dodge Gutshot and then play a Ground Swell and come across with an unblockable creature. So now Ross Marion's up to six Infect. Ross is just sitting there with a Gutshot that he can't use yet. Pendlehaven, one of the better cards that Infect has against Gutshot, because you can just open up the action. You're not committing any additional spells. Merriam's going to sacrifice a polluted Delta. He's going to fall down to 19 at least, but probably 17 because his team vents is quite free. Last SGG sale. Some Legends Pendlehavens were on sale. You better believe I got those. <laughs> <laughs> Gobbled them up. Yeah. Put them in the box. He just buried, it, buried with the rest of the Legends trash I own. <laughs> Ross, weirdly in some trouble. You would think if I've drawn a gut shot against Infect, I'm probably heavy favorite to win the game, especially with what his deck is doing. But Tom, it's not like he's never played against a gut shot before. Yeah. And Pendlehaven is a, a great way of sort of uh, allowing you to test the waters without getting blown out. So where does Ross want to start things off? He's going to start things off with the Mana Morpho. He's going to bring this thing in the ice down to three counters. He will draw a card. Some mana is added to the mana pool. Faith of Looting was the draw. He's also got a copy of Lightning Axe in hand. He'll kick it off with the Faith of Looting. Mana floating. Thing in the ice down to two counters. Marion will draw a couple of cards. He'll have to discard two, of course. Looks like he does have an Arc Light Phoenix in hand. So it was blue-red from the Mana Morphos. That means a blue mana is floating here as Ross is going to discard two cards. Arc like Phoenix in an island will go to the graveyard. Faith of Sudan is done resolving. So again, blue mana floating. Mariam will be lightning axing 
targeting. Blighted Agents. Thinking the ice down to one counter, which is a great place for it to be right now in the face of any Quantum Nexus. Yeah, particularly with Gut Shot in hand, that Miriam has the ability to access that for zero mana. Now, I do want to take a look at Awoken Horror. So I want to make sure I know the text of that card. When this creature transforms, re return all non-horror creatures to his owner hand. I didn't know if it was a non-land creature, something like that. Another Ink Moth Nexus, pass the turn back. I also like the conservative play there from Ross of bringing back the arc like Phoenix, but not attack. Yeah, there's no reason. I mean, Ross just goes. That, that, having the ability to just leave Thing in the Ice up with a gut shot is so powerful. It's almost mm -hmm. impossible for things to go wrong for Miriam if that's happening. That just don't get yourself in a position where Ross goes, all right, untap, activate my Nexus, Pendlehaven it, and now suddenly you have to you have to act then and lose your thing in the ice. Because if he can play, if he can tap out this turn for uh, a Kraken Loot Drake, one, that's great. It sets him up for lethal next turn, potentially. And, and two, it means he doesn't have to cast a spell, allowing him to not have to pull the trigger on Thing in the Ice. Well, here's Crackling Drake. That's going to draw Mary McCarr. That's another flying block. You take a look at the graveyard here. There's one, two, three. There's, a, there's five spells in here. That's a five, four okay. with a whole lot more coming, most likely. And it appears as though Miriam is in a pretty advantageous position. I mean, Miriam can literally, I mean, from this spot, he can just go attack you with Crackling Drake every turn. And if Ross ever does anything threatening, then Miriam just evacuates the whole board, mm -hmm. returns his cantrip creature, like whatever. Yeah, not bad, huh? Yeah, it's not bad. Forest, Glistener Elf. Much less powerful than the things that Ross Miriam has on his side of the battlefield. Now keep in mind, next time Ross plays a spell, that thing in the ice will transform. It's kind of, you can't miss the trigger. Right. So it would transform into a Woken Horror. Well, I, if he were to play a, another copy of Thing in the Ice, that's not so bad. It's not here comes Crackling Drake in the air, just like you thought it would. Again, five power creature right now. So Ross is going to fall down to 14. We're going to head back over to Tom Ross. What is the plan here? You know, at some point, Tom has to force Ross Miriam to basically transform this Awoken Horn. Yeah, that's but what that, it feels like to me. That that requires that, that's not a trivial exertion from Ross to even get to that spot. Because mm -hmm. you have to attack through the Arc Light Phoenix, and then have a follow up attack that's good enough against the Thing in the Ice with four counters. Yep. And then a follow up attack that's good enough against the Thing in the Ice with one counter. Yep. And then. Miriam casts a spell, and you have to do it all over again. Yeah, makes it tough. And not die. Looks like a third Ink Moth Nexus here from Tom Ross, perhaps. He's thinking about playing it. He's giving away a little bit of information that he does have a land in hand. Yeah, but he's not too sure how to navigate through it. Yep. And it makes a lot of sense. Miriam's done a great job building up a nice battlefield. There's that third ink moth. Pass the turn back. No real good attack. I think he's he's hoping that, that Ross slips up a little bit here. So Ross Marion will draw a card. Yeah, and I, you can just keep doing this until until Tom makes you stop. Right? Yeah, and Miriam's draw up here was another crackling drake. So even if Ross goes, okay, I'll block with an access and uh, use a palm spell to try to get your Drake off the battlefield. Ross still doesn't isn't compelled to do anything with Thing in the Ice. He can just tap out for Crackling Drake and, and do it all over again. All right, time to activate. Gonna block. Ross doesn't need to make a move here. Ross Miriam can sit sit steady. It's Tom Ross that actually has to make a move, and he will with a copy of Become Immense. And I, I think if I'm Miriam, I just let this go. If he's got another Crackling Drake, I don't see why not. Yeah, I just I, I, I want to leave Thing in the Ice plus. So any spell that he plays here inside of combat is going to make Thing in the Ice go off. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like a much better insurance policy to, to leave that for as long as you possibly can. Yeah, also, you know, the... Uh, yeah, I guess 
any, any, anything that Ross would play in response would just bounce everything. Yeah. So, so yeah. You, you either you're either bouncing everything or you just let it go. Yep. Those are your those are your choices. So the Pendlehaven being untapped is inconsequential because mm -hmm. everything's just getting picked up anyway. So let's go back over to Tom Ross. After that crackling drake came down, Tom is going to very quickly sacrifice the land. Now, even you know, it, he's going to fire up here. There'll be some blocks. And now a gut shot. This is actually an insane gut shot, too, because this is going to bounce everything, and Tom has already played his land. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he can't redeploy anything, basically. But I think I, I also think that Tom knew that I have to try to – I have to go for it now. Yeah. It's, I don't have a choice. It's, it's never getting better. Yep. It's never getting better. Yep. So Woken Horror – Thing in the Ice, pardon me, transforms into Woken Horror. It bounces all non-horror creatures. Now, of course, Thing in the Ice, both sides are a horror, so that's why that one stays. And yep. now, now now he's just going to try to transform and kill him. Yep. Yep. I think he's going to be able to do that rather easily as there are Serum Visions. Next up is a Bolt, perhaps. Yep, two Bolts, transform and kill you. Ross Merriam is going to win this game and match here over Tom Ross. As Grixis Phoenix is going to take care of Infect. It's a tough matchup there for Tom. It's a very good one for Ross, and Ross played it very well. Yeah, uh, just... Sat on that gut shot, being able to trigger a thing in the ice at a moment's notice there. Um, managed the game as well as he could without having to hit the reset button until he was ready to set up lethal in one turn. Very well done there from Ross Varium. Very, very, very good play. As now we're going to get our eyes here on Tanner Grace and Jody Keith. Switches to Elvis, Eldrazi Post. Jody Keith currently up a game. Let's zone into this battlefield, shall we? Get an idea of what's going on. I'm going to start with Tannen, who's got some dazes in the graveyard. He's got some dual lands on the battlefield along with the Scalding Tarn. And I see... Two insectile aberrations, a Gurmag Angela on the battlefield, and then I got Jody Keys. He's got a battlefield too. Now let's take a look at what's Ratchet going on Bomb, here. Ratchet Bomb, Candelabra of Taunos, Maze of Ith, a bunch of lands that have copied one another, presumably. Mm -hmm. And it looks like a Braid is targeting Candelabra right now, and Jody appears to be responding with a crop rotation. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, my goodness. Because you can't crop rotate for that. So he's activated Eye of Ugin is what he's done. And that's Emrakul the Promised End. Okay. Life totals are correct. It's 14 for Tan and Grace, 13 for Jody Keith. Tan and Grace will draw a card, and, and I imagine that Emrakul the Promised End is a uh, – that's a scary Magic one. Players, so and it looks like Thespian Stage is copying Maze of Ith. And we'll have to find out what the Vesuva is, but it looks like it's a copy of Cloud Post. So there we go. Got it confirmed now that that Thespian Stage is a Maze of Ith and the Vesuva is a Cloud Post, which means that, ca that casting Emrakul is not going to be hard at all. Okay, then. Well, what's Tannen got now? Delver's Secret's not exactly what the doctor ordered to go along with Snapcaster Mage and Gurmag Gangler. Especially when you know when that gigantic Emrakul will be coming here in just a moment. You know, Tom stopped by after round number one, and he said both of his both of his teammates' decks are insane. Yeah, he's like he said, if I win half my matches, we're gonna be fine. Yeah, and he's not he's not prone to hyperbole. No, <laughs> I will say that. Now you imagine Barrich has obviously got a good list from who he worked with at the last Pro Tour, but also Aaron, very very skilled player. He's our defending Invitational champion, and just one I thought it would be a pretty difficult Golgari mid range mirror match against a very good Golgari mid range player in Vanity Candio. And Jody's been messing around with lands for a while and some random brews and legacy. Maybe this is the best build of an Eldrazi-based Cloudpost deck. It wouldn't surprise me here if, 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 you know, Jody's gotten away from, you know, the lock piece and snaring bridge sort of metalworker style of deck that we've seen him play a little bit. It wouldn't surprise me if it was informed by just trying to be better against miracles and sort of blue control decks generally. Yeah. Because Cloudpost has always been a really problematic deck for... Blue control and counterbalance strategies. Mm -hmm. Just play your lands and play your stuff, and there's not a whole lot they can do about it. Emrakul, the promise then has resolved. You see the top card there of Tannis deck is a wasteland. 
So we're going to get an attack there. Emrakul's going to eat the Gurmag Angler. The Wasteland's going to come down and obviously destroy one of Jody's lands. And now he's going to make Jody search, fail to find. And I think he's, got, he's also got a place, yeah, that Wasteland in the graveyard. Not bad. Good stuff. <laughs> Good stuff. This was a standard legal card at one point, folks, and it wasn't that long ago. This was just a thing that people were doing. Got a good look to see if there's any answers to Emrakul in the deck. I'd be surprised if there were. Other thing to keep in mind, too, is Jody has a copy of Caracas in hand. Oh, yeah. He's got cover. Could uh, demonstrate the loop. He's also got enough mana to just search for something else with Ive Ugin. So, yeah. Tana knows he's beat. He can't get past this Emrakul, especially the Caracas, and that is going to do it. The team of Jody Keith, Tom Ross, and Aaron Barrett are going to take care of the team of Tana and Grace, Ross, Mary, and Brennan DeCandio. So the Bayou boys. 3-0. Three 3-0, three no. three no, baby. Great start. As Tom said, only got to win about half of them. We're going to be just fine. Well, 